Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we are breaking through our limited belief system, challenging what we've always known to find the other half of the ham. Have you ever really thought about where your ideas and opinions come from? Maybe through experience, trials, and tribulations, but how many were planted early in life never to be challenged? So many times we adopt an idea as fact or tradition and never question why. Why am I still doing this or that? And could there be a different, more productive, more joyful, or more successful way? Today, we won't accept, well, that's just the way it's always been, without some further exploration. Ready to push back from time-honored tradition and challenge your belief system? So, the other half of the ham. I better explain this concept as a basis for our talk. I heard this joke, if you will, that hit me with more than just laughter. It opened my eyes to the pitfalls of just accepting something as fact because that's what you were told, Lord knows when. This goes against my grain because I know for a fact that we're always changing, not just the world and all its improvements, but us. We are growing and changing daily. So what might have been an idea or opinion that served us in the past, without challenge, we don't know if it serves us now or in the future. So this little girl is in the kitchen with her mother, preparing a ham for dinner. She notices that she cuts off the end of the ham and casts it aside. She asks, Mama, why do you cut off half the ham? And her mother says, Uh, That's how my mother has always done it. Hmm, let's call Grandma. So they call Grandma and ask her about cutting off half the ham. And she says, well, that's how my mother has always done it. Let's call Granny. So they give Granny a ring and ask her about this process of cutting off half the ham before you cook it. And Granny says, well, because that's what size pan I had. Whoa, what a revelation. Now, after you've had a good laugh, really think about that and then think about all the wasted ham because someone down the line didn't question this belief. Back in Granny's day, she might have had a smaller oven, which required a smaller pan. Today, we aren't bound by the same limitations or restrictions. And at the very least, we should test the waters to see if we can move forward in our own thinking and doing. Let's look at our belief system and find the other half of the ham. Are you conjuring up something right now? Something that you've carried around as fact, maybe about yourself, your family, your immediate surroundings, or the world in general? Wouldn't it be fun to see what's really up? We might want to first explore this notion of limiting beliefs, why we have them, and where they come from. Aaron Morin gives us three types of self-limiting beliefs that will keep you stuck in life and what to do about them in an article she wrote for Inc.com. You have core beliefs that guide the decisions you make. They affect how you interpret the events in your life, and they influence the way you think, feel, and behave. Your healthy beliefs serve you well, but the unrealistic, self-limiting beliefs you hold on to, and everyone has some of those, can hold you back from reaching your greatest potential. It's important to acknowledge your core beliefs and examine which ones might be inaccurate and unproductive. Then you can take steps to let go of the beliefs that are limiting your potential. So here are three types of unhealthy beliefs that will make you less effective and rob you of the mental strength you need to become your best. First, unhealthy beliefs about yourself. 
Concluding that you are a loser, a failure, unlikable, or incapable will prevent you from doing your best. Even overly optimistic beliefs can be unhealthy. Thinking you're the best at everything you do and that you're above the rules can be just as dangerous to your well-being as an exaggerated negative core belief about yourself. How about unhealthy beliefs about others? Believing everyone is against you, untrustworthy, or manipulative will make it impossible to develop healthy relationships. Believing that everyone can be trusted or that everyone is a kind person can cause you to be taken advantage of or get you into relationships that aren't good for you. Then there are unhealthy beliefs about the world. Assuming that you can't succeed in today's world or thinking that the world is too dark of a place to ever be happy will take a toll on your life. On the flip side, minimizing social problems and looking at the world through rose-colored glasses isn't helpful either. There are many different beliefs you have about yourself and other people in the world around you. And while you're likely to think that all of your beliefs are 100% accurate, the truth is you likely hold on to at least a few core beliefs that are irrational and unproductive. Guess what? Beliefs turn into self-fulfilling prophecies. Unhealthy beliefs lead to unhealthy habits. And unhealthy habits produce negative outcomes that ultimately reinforce your unhealthy beliefs. It's a vicious cycle that can be tough to break. Here are some real examples that show how self-limiting beliefs turn into self-fulfilling prophecies. A woman believed she was unlovable. She jumped from one unhealthy relationship to the next over and over again. Every person she dated treated her poorly, which reinforced her belief that she was unlovable. A gym owner believed that small businesses couldn't compete in today's world. Memberships dwindled, but rather than do anything different, she resolved that her business was going to fail. She found herself in a financial crisis, and she concluded that she was going to have to close her doors because big chains were putting her out of business. A man believed that everyone was inherently bad, even when people were kind to him, He assumed that they had ulterior motives. He kept everyone at a distance and never developed trusting relationships. Anytime he felt he wasn't fairly treated, he thought it was evidence that further proved his belief that people are bad. We'll come back to how Amy suggests to change this behavior, but let's keep digging a little deeper for now. How many times do you use generalizing statements like, I always screw up, or I never win. Generalizing about yourself, the people you know, or the world is another example of falling into the limited belief trap. By accepting that you always screw up, you never win because you've already counted yourself out even before you got started. It's hard to acknowledge all the good in your life when you have challenge after challenge. But in reality, isn't that normal? Even the people you feel have it all, who seem to be gleaming with success, have faced trial after trial. Nothing is easy. And even if you're blessed with talent and good luck, you too will fail. It's a part of life and learning. And our journey would be a brisk, uneventful walk without it. So generalizations need to be challenged as well. Really? Every single time you do anything, you screw up? Can you think of a time, any time, where you were able to take something to completion? Piece these wins together to break through this belief pattern. Really? You never, ever win? Never? Can you think of a time something turned out in your favor? Assemble those instances to help you reframe your story. Your words, whether thought or spoken, are powerful and contribute a large percentage to your self-esteem. 
Setting yourself up for failure by only acknowledging your mishaps will not give you the motivation to strike out again. So how else can limiting beliefs be limiting? Amanda Alvarez shares her insight on how these limiting beliefs are preventing you from being successful in a blog she wrote for Trello. Many of us are constantly striving to grow professionally and personally in our lives. Every new year, we set aside some time to establish brand new objectives and things we want to achieve. We start the year off with admirable willpower, but it's not uncommon to arrive at a point when our motivation drops off and our plans lose their luster. How many goals have been set but never reached the finish line? Are you thinking of a few? Have you already lost touch with those goals this year? Of course, some big and small life changes could have affected your goals from coming to fruition, but your beliefs and attitude play an important part in what does and doesn't happen. What you tell yourself is what you believe. This can play a big role in how you see the world and how you feel. Open your mind and you'll discover a belief that's preventing you from being successful. What types of excuses do you tell yourself that is limiting you from being who you want to be and where you want to be? Think about that for a minute. What are some of those excuses? When you start talking about your goals and where you really want to be, what pops up as a, oh, but wait, but? Limiting beliefs are thoughts, opinions that one believes to be the absolute truth. They tend to have a negative impact on one's life by stopping them from moving forward and growing on a personal and professional level. In most cases, limiting beliefs are unconscious thoughts that act as a defense mechanism to avoid possible negative or lower vibrating emotions like frustration, anxiety, anger, or even sadness. These beliefs are often triggered according to specific episodes that may have made you suffer in the past. So your subconscious tries to block it by altering your behavior, which can result in negative outcomes like procrastination, conformism, overthinking, anxiety, imposter syndrome, and other reactions. Most limiting beliefs are largely developed during childhood. The author of the best-selling book, The Biology of Belief, Dr. Bruce Lipton, talks about how from birth to around age seven, you operate primarily in brain wavelengths that are close to a hypnotic state. When you're a kid, you are literally a sponge soaking up every little thing around you in order to record bad and good behaviors and emotions. This means that everyone develops beliefs from an early childhood, some of which are supportive and some of which are limiting. For instance, children who are treated as though they are loved and valued will develop the belief that they are loved and wanted. But children who are abused or neglected will tend to develop the belief that they are unworthy and unwanted. There are many ways to identify your limiting beliefs. A natural way of doing that is by listening to the little voice in your head. It's the voice that is constantly telling you that you cannot do, be, or have something. But maybe it's not all about you. Let's discover how self-limiting beliefs can have a larger impact on a team. Psychologist Robert M. describes in his research the importance and impact of beliefs in our lives. He says, Beliefs are like filters on a camera. What the camera sees is a function of the filters through which it is viewing its subject. In other words, how we see the world is a function of our beliefs and profoundly influences personality. As a result of our beliefs, we define ourselves as worthy or worthless powerful or powerless, competent or incompetent, trusting 
or suspicious, belonging or outcast, self-reliant or dependent, flexible or judgmental, fairly treated or victimized, loved or hated. Your beliefs have far-reaching consequences, both positive and negative, in your life. Beliefs affect your moods, relationships, job performance, self-esteem, physical health, even your religious and spiritual outlook. If teams are made by a group of people, then each of them has their own personal stories, beliefs, and values. When the team bands together, it could make or break the culture project, or task that they're collaborating to build and execute. The fact is that someone's limiting beliefs can have an impact on the team because they can create a real stumbling block, not for oneself, but also for others. For instance, say Joanna is getting closer to her project's deadline, but there's no sign of that being accomplished in time. A teammate offers help, but she says, don't worry, I got this. There are many beliefs that could be stopping Joanna from accepting help. For example, the belief of not being trustworthy, not smart enough, not reliable when she said she could do it. When you start developing your self-awareness to identify your limited beliefs, you can take the same situation and create an opportunity for improvement. Doing so will empower you to problem solve rather than limiting yourself to grow. If everyone on the team is open to doing the same, then your team will evolve into a high-functioning team. Leaders can also inspire their team by encouraging them to get their work done and brag about it to the whole company. (laughs) The more a leader encourages their team with a positive leadership style to stretch and break those limiting beliefs, the more effective and productive a team will become. Now, beware the pitfalls of limiting beliefs. There are really two key self-limiting beliefs that could hurt your team. Let's start breaking them down to help create a better and more productive workplace for your entire team. I need my colleagues to like me in order to feel loved or valued. This limiting belief also relates to something like If I don't get the approval of so-and-so, I feel sad. When you're constantly seeking approval of others to like you, you tend to accept things even though you don't like them. It's like your mind is already programmed to say yes before you think that's something you like. This can lead to a great deal of stress in a relationship or your team. You're likely to blame them for anything that goes wrong as a result of you agreeing to what they asked for. This can also have a bandwagon effect. The fear of being an odd one out and coupled with the belief that agreeing to someone's perspective will make the person like you can prevent you from speaking up and expressing your own opinion. This could make your team blind in a situation you could have contributed a better solution. On the flip side, it can also lead to burnout for those who don't speak up. So try this. First, understand why you're saying yes to everything. Then begin pinpointing the little things you can say no to before you're able to say no to the bigger projects or tasks. That way you can learn more about how you feel along the way without freaking out in the long run. It's not perfect. I need more time before I share. Another limiting belief in the workplace is when you take too much time to deliver your work because it doesn't feel perfect yet. This can slow down your team's productivity and potentially backfire with negative effects like depression or anxiety. If you're being critical of your own imperfections, you're probably doing the same to members on your team. Marie Forleo wrote a whole chapter about perfectionism in her book, Everything is Figure Out to Bull. <laughs> she explains, life doesn't demand perfection. It doesn't require you to be constantly fearless, confident, or self-assured. 
Life simply requires that you keep showing up. So try this. Cultivate an awareness of your tendencies toward perfectionism. Instead of holding the work until you perfect it, ask your team members for feedback by using the 30-60-90 framework. That way you can move faster by acknowledging the pain points of your work and leave behind the gritty details. Can you see how just a slight shift in perspective can open up a whole new world of understanding? Isn't that exciting? It's like taking a new route instead of the same old route you've done a hundred times in practically a dream state. When I started looking for the other half of the ham, by the way, if you are just joining us, you might want to go back to the beginning to understand why we even lost the ham in the first place. (laughs) At any rate, I use this exploration as a time to just think and ponder to research and listen. It doesn't have to be an aha moment, gotcha, but more of a, hmm, okay, I never thought about it that way. I looked at what I thought about myself, my strengths, weaknesses, and abilities, and questioned, is this fact something I know to be true because I witnessed it in action or something I was told? In any instance, I didn't chuck it aside, even if I, in fact, tried something and failed and adopted the mindset that I was no good at it. Remember, I'm changing and growing, so today I have new skills and new resolve. I found some additional ideas from challengingminds.org that will help us identify where to start. Limiting beliefs are those which constrain us in some way. Just by believing them, we don't think, do, or say the things that inhibit. And in doing so, we impoverish our lives. We may have beliefs about rights, duties, abilities, permissions, and so on. Limiting beliefs are often about ourselves and our self-identity. The beliefs may also be about other people and the world in general. In any case, they sadly limit us. How about some of these words? I do or don't. We may define ourselves by what we do or do not do. I may say, I am an accountant, which means I do not do marketing and should not even think about it and consequently fail to sell my services. Another common limiting belief is around how we judge ourselves. We think, I don't deserve. And so, do not expect or seek things. How about, I can't? We often have limited self-images of what we can and cannot do. If I think, I cannot sing, then I will never try or not go to singing lessons to improve my ability. This is the crux of many I can't statements. We believe our abilities are fixed and that we cannot learn. How about I must or mustn't? We're bound by values, norms, laws, and other rules that constrain what we must and must not do. Not all of these are mandatory, and some are distinctly limiting. If I think I must clean the house every day, then this robs me of the time that may be spent in something more productive. I am and am not. The verb to be is quite a pernicious little thing as we think I am, we also think I am not or I cannot. For example, we may think I am an artist and so conclude that we could never be good at mathematics or must not soil our hands with manual work. I am type of thinking assumes we cannot change. Whether I think I am intelligent or I am not intelligent Either belief may stop me from seeking to learn. I am also leads to generalization. For example, I am stupid means all of me is all of stupid and all of stupid is all of me. A better framing is to connect the verb to the individual act, such as that was a stupid thing to do. When coupled with values, We get beliefs about whether a person is right or wrong, good or bad. Others are 
and will. Just as we have limiting beliefs about ourselves, we also have beliefs about other people, which can limit us in many ways. If we think others are more capable and superior than we, we'll not challenge them. If we see them as selfish, we may not ask them for help. We often guess what others are thinking based on our theory of mind and our beliefs about them. These guesses are often wrong. We may believe that they do not like us when they actually have no particular opinion or even think we are rather nice. From our guesses at their thoughts, we then deduce their likely actions, which can, of course, be completely wrong. Faced with this evidence, it is surprising how many will still hold on to their original beliefs. There can be all kinds of limiting beliefs about how the world works, from laws of nature to property of materials. This can lead to anything from the beliefs that all dogs will bite to the idea that airplane travel is dangerous. So why do we limit our beliefs? Well, experience. A key way by which we form our beliefs is through our direct experiences. We act, something happens, and we draw conclusions. Often such beliefs are helpful, but they can also be very limiting. Particularly when we're young and have very few experiences, we may form false and limiting conclusions. Nature builds us this way to keep us out of harm's way. We learn and build beliefs faster from harmful experiences. Sticking your finger on a hot stove hurts <laughs> a lot. So we believe all stoves are dangerous and we never touch a stove again. We also form them through education. When forming our perceptions of the world, we cannot depend on experiences for everything. We read and listen to parents and teachers about how the world works and how to behave in it. But our teachers are not always that well informed. We also learn from what peers tell us and are affected by their beliefs, which may be very limiting. Education is a double-edged sword as it tells you what is right and wrong, good and bad. It helps you survive and grow. But just because you were told something means you may never try things, and so you'll miss pleasant and useful experiences and knowledge. We also believe it because of faulty logic. In decisions, we make return on investment estimations and easily conclude that the investment of time, effort, and money is insufficient, and there is a low chance of success and a high chance of failure. The return may even be negative as we're harmed in some way. People make many decision errors, for example, based on a poor estimation of probabilities. We take a little data and we generalize everything. We go on hunches that are based on more subconscious hopes and fears than on reality. The word because can be surprisingly hazardous. When we use it, it seems like we're using it for good reason. But this may not be so. We like to understand cause and effect and often don't challenge reasoning that uses the mechanism of rational argument. Pushback. We also make decisions based on excuses. One reason we use faulty logic and form limiting beliefs is to excuse ourselves from what we perceive to be our own failures. When we do something and it doesn't work out, we often explain away our failure by forming and using beliefs which justify our actions and leave us blameless. In doing so, we don't learn and we may increasingly paint ourselves into a corner limiting what we think and do in the future. How about fear? Whew, limiting beliefs are often fear-driven. Locking the belief in place is the fear that if we go against the belief, deep down, we'll get harmed. 
There's often a strong social component to our decisions, and the thought of criticism, ridicule, or rejection by others is enough to powerfully inhibit us. We also fear that we may be harmed in some way by others, and so avoid them or seek to appease them. The beautiful thing is that they are now your beliefs. Isn't that great? Whether you created them or they were planted, and because they're yours, you're in charge of them. Yay! You have the power to change your line of thinking and adopt new and fresh ideas based on who you are and where you are on your journey. So, how should we get started? Well, Amy Morin finishes up her ideas with some solutions. Ready to go back for some solutions? We've definitely identified the problem. So, how to change your self-limiting beliefs. It's tough (laughs) It's tough to change them. After all, you've likely held on to them for a long, long time and believe they were 100% accurate. You're also constantly looking for evidence that reinforces these beliefs. You're not going to talk yourself out of your beliefs overnight. Telling yourself you're not a loser won't suddenly make you believe you're a winner, at least deep down inside. The best way to change your beliefs is to challenge your beliefs head on. To do that, you need to give up the unhealthy habits that are draining your mental strength. By changing your habits, you can chip away at your unhealthy beliefs a little bit at a time from the ground up. For example, if you're purposely avoiding interacting with people because you think you're too socially awkward to make friends... Commit to introducing yourself to two new people every day. Meeting new people and putting yourself out there will change your beliefs about yourself. As you're challenging your beliefs, pay close attention to evidence that suggests your beliefs might not be 100% accurate. Slowly, over time, you'll begin to unravel some of your unhealthy core beliefs. Instead of thinking you're too socially awkward to make friends, you might be able to accept that although you are a little awkward at times, some people will like that about you. But you have to be willing to prove your brain wrong if you want to challenge your beliefs. The truth is, you're stronger than you think. Your brain lies to you sometimes. Challenging your beliefs will help your brain see you, other people, and the world in a more accurate light. Once you challenge a form of belief to test its validity in your life today, it's time to release it. What doesn't serve you must go. Just as you do a closet overhaul or a garage clean out, you too can purge old beliefs to make room for new perspectives. Dr. Matt James suggests these four steps to release limiting beliefs learned from childhood in an article he wrote for Psychology Today. Start unearthing your own limited decisions by asking yourself a few questions. What are the results you've produced in the various areas of your life? Hmm. Where are your results not in alignment with what you really want to be, do, or have? What area of your life have you really tried to improve, but no matter what, things just didn't get better? Your limiting decisions are hiding out in the areas where you're producing results that you don't want. Your limiting decisions have shaped everything you do. They've prevented you from seeing opportunities and maybe even discouraged you from trying at all. Time to bring them out of hiding. Once you do that, You have a choice. So how to identify those pesky devils? First, what do you say to yourself about that area? For example, if you're having trouble finding a relationship, maybe you explain it with something like, women only want men who have a lot of money, or guys are only interested in younger women, 
Anything you say to yourself to justify why it isn't working out for you is a limiting belief. Will that belief sound true to you? Of course. It will sound perfectly reasonable and valid, and you probably can come up with lots of evidence supporting it. But it's still a belief that is getting in the way of what you want. So unless you're willing to totally give up on your goals and desires, it's a limiting decision that you don't want to keep around. Sometimes limiting decisions are not that conscious. Maybe you've learned to squelch your negative thoughts before you get revved up and you have gotten good at positive self-talk. So you don't hear any limiting beliefs in your head. But you'll know you've still got a limiting decision lurking if your emotions are negative about that area. For example, if you're bogged down with financial pressures, how do you feel about it? Anxious? Angry? Hopeless? If you stay with that emotion and acknowledge it for a moment, you'll find the limiting belief right beneath it. For example, uh, anxiety might be saying, what will people think of me? Anger might reflect, life isn't fair to people like me. Underneath, hopelessness might be, I'm just not strong enough or smart enough to figure this out. Now that you've dragged some of those limiting beliefs out of the closet, what do you do with them? In the neuro-linguistic programming, there are several specific processes to unearth and eliminate limiting beliefs. Step one, write the limiting belief down. Play detective and follow your thoughts and emotions to discover the limiting beliefs that hold you back. Put them on paper and stare them in the face. You might note how strong each belief is and what emotions they elicit in you. Number two, acknowledge that these are beliefs, not truths. This is often the hardest step. But, but, my limitations are real. Here's the place where choice comes in. Which are you more interested in? Defending your limitations to the death or achieving your goals and desires? As author Evelyn Woe wrote, when we argue for our limitations, we get to keep them. Your choice. Step number three, try on a different belief. Use your imagination and try on a belief that is aligned with what you want. It might be something like, my financial difficulties in the past have taught me so much that I'm fully prepared to handle them now. Or, now that I've been in an unhealthy relationship, I've learned what to look for in a happy, loving partner. The trick is to go beyond just saying it. You want to really step into this new belief and feel how it feels. Done thoroughly, steps two and three will go a long way in dismantling your old limiting beliefs. Step four, take different action. This might feel scary, but act as if your new belief is true. In other words, if you really are the kind of man women adore, how would you act at parties? Who might you ask out? If you really are capable and have learned a tremendous amount from past financial difficulties, what steps would you take? If you really are the kind of person who eats healthy food, what will you put in your grocery cart? If you avoid taking any steps based on your new belief, you will just feed your old limiting beliefs. Taking action, even the smallest step, will help you solidify your new unlimiting decisions. Your first steps don't have to be perfect, just headed in the right direction. And be sure to acknowledge yourself when you've taken that step. I hope you've picked up some golden nuggets tonight, some things that might really help you uncover some of those limiting beliefs that you have of your own, whether it's personally, professionally, or even about the world around you. Maybe sit with that for a while. They're not going to come up and bubble up maybe this quickly, but when you come across either saying it in your mind, your self-talk, or repeating it out loud, Take a moment and ask yourself, hmm, is that true? Why do I think that? If you want to find that other half of the ham, 
You're going to have to dig a little bit deeper, ask some questions, listen, have some introspective time as you sort through what works and what doesn't work in your life today. If you want to share encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they are not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you, don't accept what you've always heard and known to be fact and relevant in your life today. Dust off old concepts, explore their origin and meaning, then challenge these ideas with what and who you are today. Release what no longer serves you in preparation for the fresh new perspectives you will encounter on your journey. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone through until the path was clear. That's when I found you. How I.